thank you everybody for coming. This is going to be Kyle Heeson, and he's going to talk about his presentation on refrigerant replacement. And as she said, my name is Kyle Heeson for my honors thesis. I did the experimental analysis of R134A, and we compared it to R22 and R44A simulation using engineering equation solver, also known as EASE. And my advisor on this project was Dr. Chen. It's just a quick overview of what I'll dive into. Uh, first off, just start off with an introduction of refrigerants, why we want cleaner ones, and some policies that we've gone into. A uh, quick overview of the refrigeration cycle, a quick overview of the system that we used, and then how I collected the data, redu reduced it, analyzed it, uh, and then eventually comparison, and then just talk about a little bit of what feature work we can do to help out. So why do we want clean refrigerants? So back, back in the 70s, refrigerants were of chlorofluorocarbons. So these were consist of chlorine, fluorine, fluoride, and carbon, and these had major ozone depletion, which as you can see in the photo below, means the sun breaks them up and the chlorine from them reacts with O3, which is ozone, turning it into O2, which uh, allows harmful UV rays from the sun to reach the Earth's surface. So scientists eventually created hydrofluorofluorocarbons and hydrofluorocarbons, which they had a lot lower of ozone depletion depend potential, but then they introduced a new problem called global warming potential. So this global warming potential, it's uh, an arbitrary number. The higher the number is, the better it is uh, trapping heat inside the at Earth's atmosphere. So just an example of that is R134A. If you burn up two kilograms of it, it's the same as releasing five tons of <coughs> CO2 equivalent to the atmosphere. So researchers for the future are now creating hydrofluoro olefins, which have absolutely <coughs> no ozone depletion potential and very low global warming impact. So just a couple paths and current policies that we uh, use to help regulate uh, how much refrigerant gets released and how much uh, greenhouse gases we're using. So back in the 80s, uh, the Montreal Protocol was uh, signed to phase out CFCs once the HCFCs and HFCs came out, but then it was reviewed for, H for both HCFCs and HFCs once scientists still discovered that it had ozone depletion potential. Next was the Kyoto Protocol. So this was just uh, to minimize the release of greenhouse gases. There was two target uh, time zones from 2008 to 2012 and 2012 to 2016. Uh, many countries dropped out after the, first, uh, after the first time frame due to not meeting standards. And the United States never ratified it, but was actually one of the few countries to meet the targets. And then finally, the Paris Agreement. One thing for this is to keep the temperature from two degrees from pre-industrial levels, which means the overall global temperature to what it was before we started industrializing back in the 1800s, and just continue trying to release less uh, greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. So this is just a quick uh, refrigeration cycle. On the left is a PV diagram, and on the right is actually the schematic of the system that we used. So just going to run through it quick. So starting off at the blue square, that's the compression. It starts off at saturated vapor and uh, gets compressed into a superheated vapor, which then the refrigerant goes through the condensation con condenser where it condenses from superheated vapor to a saturated liquid and goes through throttling, which is also known as expansion, where a uh, pressure drops and it becomes a liquid vapor mix. And then it continues through the evaporation cycle where it goes back to a uh, saturated vapor and the process just repeats from there. So this is the system that we used up top in the gray part. That's where the air traveled through. And then on the right, I just have a few pictures of key components that we have. So on the top left is a temperature temperature sensor. On the left side is just a metal metal, metal rod to uh, test to sense the dry bulb temperature of the air. And on the right is a metal rod in a cloth in a pool of water to get the wet bulb temperature of the air. This is used later to find out relative humidity of the air and enthalpy. On the right is the flow meter, which just measures the uh, flow of the refrigerant in liters per hour. And then on the bottom is a manometer, which measures the temperature difference between the air in the system and the air of the surroundings, which help us calculate air velocity later on in the project as well. So then this is the control panel, which controls the entire system. On the left and right, those are just where the temperature sensors are plugged in. 
And then so again, a couple main components on the top. The top left picture is the uh, sensor selector, which allows you to switch between the 11 sensors on the machine to get all the temperatures of the refrigerant and air side. The top right is the fan uh, sensor. It's just a knob that you can change the fan speed. Uh, it's just an arbitrary number. So we tested it at 12 o'clock, 3 o'clock, and 6 o'clock. So that's in 12 o'clock position. And then the bottom is the uh, heat regulators. So there's two heat regulators, one to imitate the inside temperature and one to imitate the outside temperature. So we did a cooling process. So we had 35 degrees for the inside temperature and 5 degrees for 35 for the outside temperature and 5 degrees for the inside temperature. So I just have a quick video of how the <coughs> system runs and how I would collect the data. I know it's in landscape, which is bad, but... <coughs> so, I'll talk it over because it's very noisy. So, just turn on the first switch, which turns on the entire system, and then I go and turn on the second switch for the compressor, which is the green one. And then I turn on the fan, and turn it to 12 o'clock. Again, we tested it three times at 12 o'clock, three o'clock, and six o'clock. So the sensors, that sensor there, the 35 degrees represents the temperature that we want to reach after the first preheater to represent the outside temperature. The second one there is the five degrees with the temperature you want to reach for the inside temperature. And this is just the temperature selector. As you see, when you switch it, the red number changes, which is just the temperature of whatever sensor that I'm looking at. And that involves both the air side and refrigerant side. So the air gets pulled in by the fan where it passes through the first temperature, temperature sensor, goes through the first preheater, so this one's on to represent the outside temperature, and then it goes through the evaporator. And you can't see it, but there's another temperature sensor right after the evaporator, it goes through the second preheater, which is off, and then finally out through the last uh, temperature sensor for the air side. And there's three gauges on the system to represent, to show the pressure and the um, temperature of the system goes to the flow meter. It's another pressure sensor after the compressor. And we also had a CT clamp to measure how many amps the compressor is using to figure out work. The manometer to show the, the pressure difference. And then finally back to the last pressure sensor, pressure gauge. So, after the system reaches steady state, which means all the temperatures and pressures stay the same for a good amount of time, we put all the data into an engineering equation solver, also known as EATS. So on the left side here, everything in blue and in quotes is just statements saying this was the fan, the fan was set at 12 o'clock, and then again, T underscore one, which is temperature one, is the air at the fan inlet temperature, the dry bulb. So I just go through, list all that, so people know what I'm talking about. And then on the right side is where we put in our data that we collected. So T1 is the drop, the dry bulb temperature at the first sensor, and B2 is the wet bulb temperature at the first sensor. So I go and put all that in. And then under that we have, so you can see it's called H underscore, underscore A underscore 1. So that's the enthalpy of the air at stage 1. So we found that out by, you can see, by looking at the temperature at 1 the dry temperature at one, the wet temperature at one, and the pressure at one. And we used that for all the, all the uh, enthalpies and relative humidities that we would need to solve for the equations on the bottom. The equations on the bottom are the uh, air equations to figure out how much heat is in the air. And we both, we both measured the velocity and calculated the velocity for comparisons. And this is just the th same thing, except it's on the refrigerant side. So we have one for R134A, R22, and R04A. So again, the blue is just statements. We have all of our uh, knowns for the uh, equations at the bottom. So after you put all your knowns into the thing, get all the equations right, you click solve, and it pops out a screen like this with all the answers that you need in a matter of a second. So the thing that we want to focus on mainly is the Q dot evap air. This is the amount of energy that is in the air that can be removed or, or added to whatever you want. So as you can see, there's two of them. We have calculated and just regular calculated is we looked at the pressure differences in the air. And as you can see, the pressure one that is calculated is higher because it's ideal and ignores heat losses to the surroundings and possible condensation formation. And on the right, it's just a psychometric chart 
which just shows the uh, change in relative humidity, humidity ratios, enthalpy changes, and temperatures. And you can tell that it's a cooling process because from two to three, there's a massive um, temperature drop and enthalpy drop. And again, this is the same thing, except it's for the refrigerant side. So again, we have a couple more things. We have, again, the heat that the evaporator is able to take out, the work of the compressor, which we will use to find out COP, which is coefficient of performance, which basically you want to have the highest COP possible because it means you're taking out the most amount of air with the least amount of work. So a COP of two would mean taking out two kilowatts of air heat for one kilowatt of work, and a COP of five would be five kilowatts of heat for one kilowatt of work. And then again, this is just a TS diagram. It's very similar to the PV diagram, just repeating the, um, the process of compression and all that, except this is from the data collected. As you can see from three to four, it's not a perfect straight line down because of, in an ideal system, there wouldn't be any entropy gain during that or loss. But since we're not using an ideal system, it moves a little bit to the right, showing that the cooling capacity isn't at the maximum. So now after we found out the, uh, all the heat for the refrigerants and the air side, we want to find out the heat, effective trans heat transfer effectiveness, which is just how well the refrigerant and the evaporator is at taking the heat out of the air. That's as simple as just taking the heat that the refrigerant was able to take out of the air over the total amount of heat in the air. So these are the, all the... Um, results that we got from testing the R134A, R22, and R44A. So R134A has the highest COP, and it makes sense in the system because the system is meant to run on this system, on this refrigerant, and the refrigerant was running at pressures ideal for 134A. So R2, R22 usually runs at higher pressures, so if you're able to change the pressure of the system, the COP might have been higher. As you can see from 12 o'clock to 3 o'clock, there's a large jump in COP, and then there's a smaller one from 3 o'clock to 6 o'clock. The um, COP takes a logarithmic curve to it, so the COP is getting closer and closer to maximum, so no matter how high we turn on the fan, it's going eventually going to reach its maximum and not be able to get any better. However, 6 o'clock is the highest span, fan speed you're able to get to, so we couldn't test any higher than that. So then again, this is the this is the cue for the air. That's just the total amount of energy and heat that we were able, that we would be able to take out of the air at the three different um, at the three different fan speeds. And again, it has the same logarithmic curve to it, where as the fan speed increases, so does the possible heat in the air. But again, we'll eventually just read a max where there can't be any more. So then I have the three uh, heats of the refrigerants at the three fan speeds. As you can see. Again, as it, increase, it increases, uh, as the fan speed increases, just because there's more air going through the system, so the more refrigerant is able to take out more heat in general. And the heat transfer effectiveness. For both R134A and R404A, you can see that there's a large increase from 12 to 3, and then there's a slight decrease from 3 to 6. This is usually because systems aren't meant to run on their max uh, max levels for a long amount of time because it does decrease their efficiency. And again, we get uh, effectiveness of over 100% for R404A because, again, it was just a simulation and ease. And if we were working <coughs> the system at uh, proper pressures for R404, the Q of the R404 refrigerant wouldn't be as high. So just some future work that we can look into to help comparisons, make comparisons better. So actually replacing the R134A in our system with R22 and R44A so requires some background research because certain refrigerants need certain lubricants in the system to work properly. But this would allow for a better comparison of COP and heat transfer effectiveness. And then also an ISAT 301 type lab manual the lab manual we got from the company, it's a Spanish company, and you could clearly tell that the translation was awful. And half the time, it was talking about a completely different system. So we spent a lot of time just trying to figure out how it worked the system. We couldn't even get the compressor to turn on. We thought it was broken on uh, arrival. So we had to, so I'll just have step-by-step -step directions on exactly how to turn it on, how to, 
how to get it working, and it's just more consumer friendly than the one that we got. And then just some acknowledgments. Uh, just like to thank the entire ISAT faculty for giving us the opportunity to have a research op opportunity like this for to future our careers. Definitely looks good on a resume. Uh, the ISAT uh, maintenance personnel, we had to find a room that could fit our system and change some uh, electrical sockets to run our system because it couldn't be plugged into just the regular wall socket. And Dr. Chen for just guiding me through this entire thing and helping me out whenever I had to. Any questions? Um, when you're doing some of the policy background stuff, what was um, what was one of the previous types of Freon that was, has been outlined, I guess, like in the 70s? I think you might have touched on it, but it wasn't um, there that you came across it at all. I just know there was one type of Freon I thought, like we switched to 130A now, 134A because it was better than the previous. <coughs> I was I wasn't yeah. sure. Yeah, it is R22. Oh, okay. So <coughs> it's not used in like commercial systems anymore just because it is just really bad for the environment. Okay. So that's why I've been moving towards more cleaner ones. Okay. And again, specific refrigerants are used for specific <coughs> purposes. Uh, purposes. Yeah. Cool. Um, when you were comparing the two Q values, the experimental and the calculated, um, what are some ways that you can reduce heat loss to raise that experimental Q value? Um, so on the system already, there is a lot of, there's some insulation <coughs> around the pipes, so that's one way. Um, you could probably get better insulation, but overall there's always going to be heat loss. So the where the uh, air duct was going through, there wasn't any insulation around there, so that's probably where most of it would be released, especially at the beginning when you're heating everything up in the heat exchanger. So insulation is basically the big, only really thing you can do for a system that's already pre-built and everything. What made you interested in Freon? <coughs> um, I don't know. I just thought it was like something different because I see a lot of energy students do a lot of energy audits, solar panel backpacks and that sort of thing. But from what I've seen, I haven't seen anyone really look at refrigerants. And I just thought it would be something different to present about. Cool. Watch it. <laughs> okay, thank you for coming. You know, this is not a joke of day, but I just want to share. <laughs> uh, nowadays, if you want to have an R22, you have to drive to Mexico. <laughs> yeah, because in the United States, you know, no mechanic shop will carry, you know, will refill your, you know, AC with R22. You just have to drive south. <laughs> That's what I, I was told, but I'm not 100% sure. <laughs> Okay, good job.